Good day. I'm Guy Wallace, and I'm here with Michael Davies from Helsinki, Finland, to discuss some of his experiences in performance-based instruction, uh, adopting and adapting some of my methodologies and such. We started this uh, because he sent me a message on LinkedIn and said a particular performance modeling workshop didn't go exactly to plan. Between me and you, the team didn't realize that their processes weren't exactly harmonized across the region, but I've used the same processes in different projects recently. Well, that really resonated with me because so often in my analysis meetings, the master performers assembled by my client from across the company um, soon found out that they did not have standard practices, that they were all doing things a little bit differently. And then we used the analysis meeting to define what were the best practices as people went through their performance. And, and the master performers contributed, but they also learned from each other. And that was our way of approaching the analysis of performance in all of its variances so that we could construct some performance-based instruction, either job aids or performance guides or learning experiences uh, to help people master their performance requirements from back on the job. So Michael, thank you again for agreeing to do this video with me. Uh, could you do uh, something before we launch into all this? Could you share with our audience uh, your story, your background in L&D and uh, how you came across some of my stuff, where you were in the process of getting to a performance-based orientation, and then we can launch into some of your experiences, your stories. I can absolutely do that. Thank you, Guy. I have to say it's an absolute privilege to talk to you today. I've been in the game about 13 years, and your processes have helped me along the way from day one. So when I knew I was going to speak to you, I had to go back through my LinkedIn to see when I actually started in learning development. And it feels like a longer time ago than 13 years. It was 2011. Now, I came into L&D from a teaching background, which I know a lot of people do. And I think sometimes it can do you a disservice and sometimes it can really help you. I think traditional teaching sometimes does you a little bit of a disservice coming into L&D because you have that education mindset. Mm -hmm. You think that people need a lot of knowledge to get through tests, things that they need to remember. And we know in L&D, in the corporate world at least, that's not really the case. Now, mine was language teaching. I was a language teacher before L&D. So I kind of think there's a difference because in language teaching, it's practical or nothing. People come to class because they want to be able to go and order a coffee. They want to be able to open a bank account. So if you're teaching them theory without any practice, that classroom is going to empty quite quickly. And I think that kind of philosophy I took over to L&D. And that, so it was almost like a performance-oriented viewpoint without actually knowing what that was at the time. So I moved over to L&D. And, and since then, I've been in-house, I've done consulting, I've worked in third parties as well. I have to say, I much prefer being in-house, which is where I am at the moment. But when I started, I was completely at sea. What? How do I start analysing a problem? I get these people come to me and say, I need this slide deck changed into a course. Okay, I can do that. And then you kind of, the more I got into it, the more I realized, I'm not sure this is actually solving any problems. Now, the first time I came across your work, I was trying to think it was probably either the MCD, the Modular Curriculum Development, or the CAD book I got my hands on. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a light bulb moment to me because I could see, wait, there's actually a structure I can follow here to move away from taking that order and just doing whatever the people who have the money and the budget want me to do to thinking, wait a minute, what's your actual problem here? Because I think we, I'll go into that when I go into some examples at the moment, but yeah, <laughs> from then I've, I started off at the Royal Bank of Scotland 11 years ago and that was in house. That was great because all the people I was training was in, one giant office, probably mm -hmm. less than 500 people. It's highly regulated. 
So I kind of had those barriers around me when I'm cre creating these learning experiences. Then I moved into consulting with Capitus, still within a financial regulation area. I've done some consulting work, which I really like. I was in a third party for a while. That was my least favorite because you don't really have the ability to say, wait a minute, that this might not solve your problem. They've paid a certain amount of money for you to create an e-learning course or a management course. If I say, this might not be what you need, nobody gets paid. So I didn't stay there for very long. And now I work for Conic Cranes, which is an industrial crane manufacturer. Head office in Finland is where I am now. This is like my ideal place, I think. Large company, I think we've got about 15,000 employees at the moment. And I really like being able to get my name out there as someone you can trust to solve a problem. So being within a company really, really suits me. But yeah, going back to where I came across your work, I've, I've kind of podged together a lot of different ways of working and theory. I, I heard you say the phrase that we stand on the shoulders of people who came before us, and I absolutely have done that, mainly from yourself, but Will Fallheimer, Patty Shank, Carl Binder, Julie Dirks, and all of these great people who put this content out there to help people like me that might not have had that face-to-face face mentor, someone who's got a strong background in L&D. So I was able to pick some of these from great people like yourself. So thank you. Thank you very much for guiding me along my way. Well, you're most welcome. I think that uh, many of the people that I that you mentioned, and uh, not all of them, but many of them were uh, members of uh, NSPI, which is now ISPI nowadays, the International Society for Performance Improvement. And back in the NSPI days when I joined back in 79, the whole feeling of the organization was sharing. Everybody was sharing with each other, even the most famous gurus who might be gruff. You know, Joe Harless might joke and say, you know, you'd come up and ask him a question. He'd say, you got any money? You know, and then he'd laugh and and then he'd uh, invite you to to discuss with him your whatever issue or uh, thing you brought to him. But uh so I, I think that many people um, like that you mentioned are have that tradition, have that tradition of, of sharing. And with social media, it's so much more easy now. But uh, so so tell me a little bit about that project where, you know, the, the people didn't, you know, you went in to do an analysis meeting, I'm assuming. And it was through the process of defining the performance that people realized that that they were doing things differently? Is that what happened? In a way, yeah. So I, I, I generally think there are two options when people come with a request. You can do it the traditional way, which I think the vast majority of people in L&D do. They have an order for training. They take the order. They say, do you have any slides that you want me to work on? They give you the slides. You work with one SME. You take all their expert knowledge out of their head and you put it in a training course. Everybody goes through the training course. That's the easy way, but it's not the way that works. But I, I have a hot take that in L&D, we are actually incentivized to do a bad job. Let me explain that. So the easy way when somebody comes to a request is to do what I just said. Design that training material. The person who orders it, ticks it off. We as L&D tick it off. People go through, they had a nice time, they give us five out of five on the smile sheets, everybody's happy. Did it solve the problem? Probably not. So we can go away and say that was all great, it was easy. But then there's the second option, which is to actually solve the problem, and it's harder. And we have to use tactics to kind of convince people that Give me a bit more time in analysis and I can actually solve your problem. And you get the same response. Come on, I know what the problem is. I just need everybody trained. Again, easy route. But if I, back in 2011, if somebody came to me, I might have said something like, 
Are you sure it's a knowledge problem? Are you sure it's a skills problem? And they go, yes, give me the training. And it puts them off. If you don't do it, they'll order somebody else. But then you kind of realize now my approach is if somebody comes to me and says, like with this project that we've got ongoing at the moment, we need training. I say, great, you might. But if you can give me a little bit of more time up front to do some analysis, and I've stolen this all from you, Guy, I can make sure that it solves your problem for you. And they say, okay, this is why I like being in-house, because I can say, oh, well, I did this project in the US. The head of L&D there, he'll vouch for me, he'll say that this is great, this kind of thing. So with this project that we have at the moment, it's training a group of managers. And managers, I think, is sometimes tricky to do this performance model, which I'll explain in a moment. But then, so I can say, let me do this analysis. And when I do this analysis, I'll draw on one of your methods. And this is where you'll tell me I've been doing it wrong all these years, is the performance modeling workshop. So instead of getting one SME to tell me everything that they know, I'll say, great, you're going to be in the workshop. And we also want some master performers, people that you know are doing the job incredibly well. Everyone agrees. We might have some novice performers. We might have some managers of these people. But we get these people in a room and I say, give me two days to create this performance model. And from that, we we'll look at what outcomes we want to have. We'll then produce the outputs, the tasks, the measures, the standards, and any performance gaps. And... As soon as they start to do this, and I can say, great, so we don't need to think about training now in this analysis, but you can see where the training's heading, can't you? We don't have to go for theory on financial reporting. We can say, this is the financial report that we need to do. Now, this particular project is a bit of a tricky one because if I compare it to a project that I did before that, it was in the US. The US is great. It's big, there's loads of states, but it's mostly homogenized. Any legislation, probably not state-based, it's fine. So I can get people, I'll get them from around the country and we'll do that. Now, this project is for EMEA, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Now, I know what you're thinking, one size all fits training doesn't work, and I'm with you, but it's kind of what we have to work with sometimes. So I say, Another reason, we've got this wide audience, design and training is difficult, let me do the analysis, come into this workshop. But the problem was we get to this workshop and then there's SMEs who know the whole process and then we've got master performers from select countries and we say, okay, let's talk about one aspect. A particular type of meeting that everybody does. Okay, so what do you need to produce for this meeting? Well, we need a reporting deck. And then one person from another country pipes up and says, well, we kind of do that, but we call it a different name. And we go, ah. And then we talk about something else. And, we, and then they go, oh, well, that legislation doesn't really apply to us. Ah, but it does to you over there. Right, okay. And you see the SME's eyes get a little wider. Now, it's not that they don't have the proper oversight. It's that they can't have oversight of all the master performers jobs. So then they kind of go, ah, well, that's different. They go away with quite a list of things that they need to improve. And at the end of day one, I got a comment that was, oh, I'm so sorry that that workshop didn't work. And I said, what are you talking about? That's exactly what the workshop is for because it's meant to uncover these things. It's by no means a showstopper, but if we realize this thing when we were designing training in two months' time, then it's a disaster. Because people can't have the whole knowledge of everything. We work on an unconscious knowledge. So getting people in the room uncovers those blind spots. So it was absolutely perfect. Now, the second day, did I have to kind of tweak things? Because we're not going to get... The aim of a two-day workshop was to ideally get the deriving knowledge and skill requirements for each of these outputs, but 
getting there was a little bit more difficult. So we just had to kind of simplify things, adapt it in order to get what we needed out of this workshop. And it's great. And the project's going really well. But it's it was great to see that these methods that I've taken from you and kind of tweaked and adapted along the way do uncover these things in analysis. So the workshop didn't achieve its aims, but it worked. Well, it, it might have achieved its aims if you were thinking that there's some performance that's, you know, a uniform, universal, everybody does it. And there's other performance that's unique to perhaps a country, perhaps a office, whatever. There's all sorts of various reasons. And if the job is to, if the analysis world is to figure out what performance is common to everybody and what's unique, that way that that informs your design, the modularity or the configuration of content so that you can give people what they need and let people skip what they don't need and yet get the core. So if there is a core part, you might have various versions of what you deploy, what you deliver, that in you know for one country it may have a b and c in another country it may have a b and d and another country it may just have a and b um meeting the performance requirements of the audiences so so i've had clients who've reacted the same way thinking that the meeting was a disaster you know nothing's the same but if we're trying to do performance-based instruction and help people master their jobs that's our goal is to figure out what are the performance requirements and what are the variations that are across our target audience and how then, you know, we're not worrying about modularity and configuring content now, just trying to understand what's that job and what are the enabling knowledge and skills. And then to think when we get into the design meeting, um, how do we configure all of this content to meet the performance requirements of everybody. And so my experience has been when that's happened, we spend time determining what what is simply language differences. It's really the same thing. We just call it something different. There's that. Then there's times when we use the same language to mean different things. So we're always dealing with communications and language and labels that have been used and not and most organizations in my experiences are not uniform in what they call things at the kind of the micro level, you know, on the West coast and the East coast of your country, you know, it's, it's going to be different and, uh, or could be different. And that's one of the goals to find that out because when we train people in what's a common core set of language and labels and procedures, and they go back to their work uh, contexts and it's called different things, and it looks different and feels different, that's a, a huge adjustment for the learner to make to figure out, well, here's what I've learned, but here's how it, you know, and so the closer we can get to what it really looks like out there in their real world, we create near transfer content rather than far transfer or far, far transfer, where we're so far removed from what that authentic performance looks like that people can learn things, they can master things, they can pass a knowledge test, they can pass a performance test, they can go back out on the job, and then it doesn't transfer, and then it can't have impact. And that's what we're always struggling with. But that's what I found. So your, your story resonated with me because I've been there so many different times when the master performers themselves said out loud, we do things differently. When my client, who is in the room, <laughs> insisted that they'd all do things the very same way, which I knew probably isn't true, but maybe it is. And so let's go find out. Let's bring in the right people here so that we have credibility with what we create um, and see what happens. Um, but anyway, so I, th I thought that was a, a, a great example that I thought should be shared with people so they should know you don't go into an analysis team meeting and find out everything's the same. And if it if it seems like it is, that probably means you haven't delved deep enough into the details for people to uncover those things. You'll probably get to those details when you do the development of your content. But if you don't have a mindset that says this thing is called three different things, depending on where you're at, 
And I've got to contend with that language issue for of the target audience, that labeling issue. Um, how do I handle that? You know, and that's a client decision sometimes to standardize on, you know, calling this thing one thing. And then we can support that. Or if they say that's too politically, you know, difficult to do, we're not going to do that. Then our training has to contend with the fact that we're going to call this one thing here by these three different names. And everybody should know that because if you're talking to somebody on another part of the company, they call this, which you might call a pen, they might call it a writing instrument. And you've got to know that in order to really communicate effectively with them. So, exactly right. Go ahead. I, I go think ahead. That, Tell me, share some more. Uh, well, I was just thinking when you said about clients don't always know that these things are happening. I, I, I like to tell them beforehand. I say, you have oversight. It's not your job to understand the complexities of all these countries, all these departments, all these teams, whatever it is. And I say to them, if you give me this analysis meeting, two days of your time, yes, it might be an expense. We might have to travel, fly people in or whatever. I, I'm sorry, but you're going to go away from this meeting with a list of things that you didn't know about. And it's going to be things that aren't necessarily in L&D's world. I would like them to be. I would like not to be called L&D, but that's a different topic. I'm going to say there's performance things. I can sort those. There might be process things. There probably will be. There might even be incentivizing things. There's going to be a lot of things that you're going to go away with. It's going to give you a headache. And that's what this meeting does. And they go, well, I don't believe you, but test me. Yeah. And in no meeting, in no analysis have I ever done, whether it's in a two-day workshop or whether it's me doing interviews and doing things separately, has... Have I just got the process there and everyone goes, yep, that's the process. We follow it. It's great. Everywhere. Like highly regulated financial institutions that I've worked at, yeah. there are still gaps because that's what we do. We have to try and improve things every day. But it is great to see these people who are so confident about their processes or knowledge or whatever it is go, ah, okay. That's something we need to fix. Oh, yeah. this is really informative. That tells me what I'm the next day. And I, 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 I love I, the I fact completely... when I love the excuse me. I love the fact that when your clients are so sure about something, and the goal and the 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 approach to this is to go say yes, you're right, of course, but but let's see, you know, to to have that that uh, skepticism, if you will, about that, and to. You know, it, it, when we take our clients along on the journey, it, beginning in the analysis phase, that's eye opening for them. You're right. They have oversight responsibility. They're responsible in some form or fashion for the performance, but they don't understand the details. They're usually too far removed to understand the root causes of problems. And they see training as the solution to a problem because they don't understand the details well enough. And we shouldn't be fighting them. We should say, yeah, you're probably right. Let's go see. And let's go find out what is really at the root of this and how we can best uh, address this. And then let the data chips fall where they may. Let the analysis data fall out as it will. And let it, we'll all learn together as to, you know, what's ideal, what's the current state, what are the gaps, what are the causes, and what can learning and development do about any of those causes we might be able to warn people about things but we can't fix them and maybe some things are not fixable it's outside of the scope of our organization maybe it's an external environmental thing that causes things that we have to deal with and but but that's part of what we need to uncover so we can share that with the learners so that when they go back to the job as performers they've been prepared for that context uh, and those requirements and all the variations therein. Exactly. And it goes back to what you were saying about modularizing this content. So this is where we are now. We've, we've done this analysis and everyone goes, that's great. We've got the performance. We've got ideal state. We know some of the performance gaps at the moment. And now we're into design. Traditionally, it would be get everybody in a training course, sit down and get all that knowledge from the experts, but now we've been able to kind of modularize it because we can see from the performance model, some of these people will have these skills from their previous experience. Some of them, they'll be 
recruited with those skills so we can support their managers when these people join. And these people don't join 20 at a time. It might be one in one country, one yeah. in another, one in September, one in January. So we can, we might have a face-to-face -face element to it, but we'll also have these modules that they can sit down with their manager and say, okay, technical experience, you've got that, fine. But you might need this policy, right? these kind of things. So then they can pick and choose. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's important. When we create a what I call uh, the the curriculum architecture design for a target audience, it's it's part of a larger whole conceptually of a curriculum architecture for an entire enterprise. And my goal has always been to create content that's either um, as shareable as possible, either as is or after adaptation. So if if there's a policy. Maybe there's many different target audiences need that policy. What they do with that policy varies. So there's a shareable piece of content on the policy, but then what? how do you apply that policy in your work performance? Maybe that's different. So I'm always looking for how do I share you know, those, those shareable chunks of content on how to do a spreadsheet or you know, how, to do, how to read a financial statement or whatever those things are. There's a lot of jobs that share that. And so my goal has always been to increase the share, appropriate shareability of content through this concept of modularization. You know, I have modular paths of modular events, of modular lessons, of modular. So it's all this, you know, like a Lego uh, a house that you build with different rooms and you assemble it all together. How can you reuse some of those pieces? Because that saves our our, our shareholders our, and our stakeholders time and money when we can reuse things. But if we don't bolt on, if you will, the things that make it specific to the learner's performance, then we've done a disservice to the organization. We've given education when we really needed training. We needed education plus application, which is training in my view. Um, and we don't want people to come at things with a mindset where we're just giving people a bunch of information and, and testing their knowledge. And, you know, it's really all about the ability to apply that back on the job. Exactly right. And when you do modularize these things, you can then move them around. They don't have to be in a training setting. It can be like in the flow of work. Yeah. You need to do your financial reporting. Bingo. There's your job aid. Your yep. Tiny yep. training module, whatever it is, it's not locked in a training course that you've you'd run twice a year. Yeah. And something else you mentioned there, which, which made me think of another little nugget of information that I've got from you, is that some people learn from an education setting. A very small amount of people can have the ability, the skill to transfer that to their work. I've heard you say that those people are probably more likely to rise up and become the higher level people within a business. So they think that everybody else learns like that. Yeah. And it really resonated with me because the people who make who come to us and say, I need training for my, yeah. my thousand people in my, underneath me. And I, they say, I learned from university. I used to be a lawyer. So just give me the information. Yeah. I'll turn it around in my head and apply it. That's not how most people learn. That was so that was from Dr. Wrestle it from them. Yeah, that was from Dr. Richard E. Clark, who taught me this about 20 years ago. And he said back then that between five and 15% of people can learn out of context. They can be taught something and they can already see how it applies here and here and there. And they can see that. And so yeah, that was my speculation. I don't know, I don't have any backing for that, but but it seemed to me that that a lot of executives that I've dealt with think that people can just be informed and they'll be able to do because they probably could. That's how they see themselves. That's how they see the world. And they don't understand that, that we can't just give people information or education. We might have to guide them in their application of what they've learned into their workflow process performance. And if we don't do that, then it's all been for naught. We just wasted all that time and energy and money developing content, deploying that content, 
but it really didn't have the impact that we wanted it to. It's a hard thing for clients to uh, learn. I've had clients that have fought that, you know, through more than one project. They thought we just got lucky the first project, but it wouldn't happen again, you know. And so it is when you're dealing with clients or other stakeholders who have a mindset of this is how, what works because they know it. They just know that because that's ex their experience. So that makes it a struggle for us in doing that. Um, yeah. Let me uh, shift gears here for a moment. So we've talked about uh, what you've done with uh, some of my approach to analysis and such. Um, so I'm always interested in people who have this performance orientation to instruction or training or learning. And, I, you know, so where else, who else have you been learning from in an enterprise in a corporate setting uh, that you've been learning from that have had impact, have been uh, helpful to you. So it's a chance to do a little shout out, a little call out for some people here uh, to point others to uh, who, if if they're interested in, in establishing a performance orientation to instruction, you know, who should they look to? Absolutely. I mean, where to start? There've been so many people over the years that I've taken some of these theories and practice to kind of move to a performance orientation. Like I've, I remember picking up quite a hefty tome from Paul Kirchner and that was kind of really heavy about how people learn, how best to kind of design things for learning. But then that was great for theory, but mm -hmm. I, it's trying to convert that to a corporate sense where time is money and we really need to get people performing well early on i to take a step back i often see learn and development applies to the phrase if you've got a hammer everything looks like a nail or if you've only got a hammer and i kind of think if you've only got instructional design everything looks like a training course mm -hmm. so i I'm not a performance consultant, but I try to apply some of those performance improvement practices. And Carl Binder was great for that with his six boxes model. Super simple, but it, it pulls in some of those other things that are going to affect your result. It's not just training. Is it environment? Is it incentives that these people are doing? Could it be that the people just aren't the right people for the job? These kind of things that we don't often think about, we don't often have the scope to do it in learning and development because sometimes we, a lot of the times, L&D has a bad reputation because people think, oh, it's that boring compliance course that I had to go through. And you're like, yes, it is, but we can also help you fix problems. And that's why I like being in-house because you can build that reputation. I mean, a if we want to build that reputation, we have to be able to prove a return on investment. To do that, we have to evaluate it. And a, a key person for me for evaluation is Will Polheim. His L10 model for evaluating projects is fantastic because it shows you, I mean, your smiley sheets, kind of great, but you're not going to be able to prove much there. But if you can work up the levels that he produces in a quick fact sheet, you can work towards proving that ROI. So I, 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 I'm I, implementing LTEM here, and it's it's great. Excellent. Um, who else do I want to thank in this? Uh, Patty Shank's great book on multiple choice questions. That was a lifesaver for me when it came out, and we're trying to reverse engineer some slide deck to become an e-learning to actually think, how can we make these multiple choice questions work? I mean, Julie Dirksen for how people learn. There's so many people that are out there on LinkedIn, on blogs, sharing their great material. I mean, for me, I've not always had an in-person mentor in L&D. So to have these people like yourself, like all the people I've mentioned, is incredible. Uh, sharing their knowledge and their ways of working, you can really apply these to move to a performance orientation. Well, thank you. Um, on their behalf, thank you for uh, mentioning those people. Um, so uh, let's wrap up by 
what would you, you've been in the business 13 years, you were a teacher before that, but you've been in the enterprise learning and development field now for a while. And so if you look at new people coming into the profession, what would be your one or two or three suggestions uh, for them to help ease them into uh, doing better L&D? Excellent question. My first thing I think would be to move beyond the portfolio. Don't pay for those incredibly expensive e-learning designer courses. If you are, great, but think beyond that. Think about what these e-learnings or whatever you're designing are meant to do. Just scratch at the surface a little bit. Do some root cause analysis to say, what is this trying to solve? Are you measuring this problem that you have? Are there any other aspects around this that could not be, a, that might not be a knowledge or a skill thing? So I, I guess that would be it, to try and put it into context, not just mm -hmm. look at your design. Yeah. Root cause analysis is, is a great one to learn, I think. Loads of different simple ways of doing it, Ishikawa, five whys, whatever you want to do. Just ask those questions. Don't refuse the order. Take the order, but do a little digging. They'll say, okay, I can do that for you, but let me just look at your problem. Or let's just get your problem down on paper. Yeah. What would I have for a third one? Hmm. That's a tricky one. <laughs> It <laughs> put me on the spot there. there. There's two. There's probably too many opportunities or too many things that you might recommend. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, root cause and anal cause analysis, and I guess just a general focus on performance. Yeah, think about if you're training something, you might have to do that course that the high performer wants you to do. Bookend it. Tell them why you're doing this course. And if they have to do that course, which sometimes we do, bookend it and help these people transfer that theory into practice. The nearer, the better. Yeah. There we go. I thought of a third one. <laughs> <laughs> well, very good. Michael, thank you uh, again for uh, taking the time to share with us um, your learnings from app applying some methodologies to affect performance through performance-based uh, instruction and training and learning. Uh, any final words before we close? I just want to thank you, Guy, for being my indirect mentor or inspiration for the past 13 years. You spent so much time sharing your vast knowledge and your processes to help people like me. And it it really has benefit benefited me in so many ways in, in my career. So thank you so much. Michael, you are so welcome. And uh, it's my way of uh, paying it back to my many mentors. Uh, as one of them told me, Gary Rummler told me that I could never pay him back. I would have to do what he had to do because he couldn't pay his mentors back either. And that was we can all pay it forward. So I invite you to pay it forward and you are doing it with this video here. And uh, again, thank you for uh, uh, taking the time to share with us today. I absolutely will pay it forward. So thank you very much, Guy. All right, bye-bye. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. All right. Cheers now, bye-bye. Bye-bye.